Okay, so I think I'm going to stand down here. <laughs> All right. Oh, I do need the mic. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, everyone hear me? Yeah. Good? All right. Uh, I much prefer clip-on mics, <laughs> so keep me honest if I move this away from my map. All right. Uh, so what I'm talking about today is uh, compiler verification. And uh, basically what I wanted this talk to be about is to sort of talk about, you know, kind of what I think are the next generation of compiler verification challenges. All right. Um, so let's, um, let's sort of get into it. Um, okay, so compiler verification. It's a really, really old problem, right? Dates all the way back to this uh, first paper by uh, John McCarthy and James Painter, uh, Correctness of a Compiler for Arithmetic Expressions, right? This paper is from 1967. Um, and since then, there has been, well, you know, there's been a lot of work on compiler verification, but most notably the work that we all kind of keep talking about, um, you know, that's been really exciting is uh, Xavier Leroy's paper on, on uh, CompCert, the CompCert C compiler, uh, which uh, was, you know, in 2006, formal certification of a compiler backend or com programming a compiler with a proof assistant. So the work on CompCert was really exciting for the community because basically it showed us all that, hey, you can actually implement a full-fledged compiler, um, you know, with a whole bunch, you know, with a fair amount of optimizations uh, using a proof assistant. And before CompCert happened, before this 2006 paper, I think most of us would have been really skeptical. Most of the community would have found that surprising. Uh, but since then, of course, right, um, this, once this demonstrated that you can d uh, build realistic verified compilers um, and that they do have benefits um, for actual users, which this PLDI 11 paper showed, um, then, you know, there were a whole bunch of people who started uh, doing proof mechanization and proving their compilers correct. So what CompCert really did is it provided this proof architecture for others to follow and build upon. Um, and that led to a whole uh, lot of work, like sort of essentially, I would sort of say, a renaissance in compiler verification. Um, and this is just a tiny little sample, right? So people followed up um, by doing um, relaxed memory concurrency, adding relaxed memory con concurrency to CompCert. Uh, there was the work on uh, the verified LLVM or Vellum, uh, where they have uh, verified um, um, the mem to reg pass in the LLVM backend, uh, and uh, a very uh, impressive effort, the Cake ML compiler, which is a full-fledged uh, ML compiler, fully verified in Hall. So, um, what I want to talk to you about today is. Since 1967, the vast majority of work that we have done in compiler verification has basically made a whole program assumption. Um, so you get a correct compilation guarantee um, that only applies if you compile a whole program. Now this is a problem because it doesn't really match the reality of how we use our compilers, uh, because in reality you almost never compile a whole program. We usually compile program fragments or components or modules, whatever you want to call them, partial programs. Uh, so I'm going to be, um, you know, in my slides you're going to see a whole program. I'll write a capital P for. So if you, um, so I have a P source, PS, and compiling to a PT. Those are whole programs. And I'll write lowercase e's for program expressions, if you will, that are pieces of a program. So I have E source compiling to E target. So in reality, we compile fra fragments and then link them with something, usually with low-level libraries or uh, something from the runtime. Or more generally these days, um, we build a lot of multi-language software, right? So we might write some code in a different programming language and compile it down to the target and then link uh, code from our verified compiler with that other code from a different compiler, right? And what we don't have is any sort of story for what compiler correctness should mean in that kind of a setting. All right, so that's what I want to talk about today and how that opens up a whole vast um, area of research challenges. Okay, so um, how do we do compiler verification when we're compiling partial programs? Now this area has seen some work and so what I want to focus on in this talk is I want to tell you a bit about you know, this issue of how do we even specify compiler correctness when you're compiling components and not whole programs. Um, so I'll spend like sort of half of my talk on that. Uh, and then I'll go into um, sort of other harder challenges, like how do we ensure that our compiled code, the code produced by the verified compiler, is protected from something that you link it with, 
right? Think of that code that you're linking with as an attacker. Um, what are the security exploits that are possible? Um, how do we, you know, do secure compilation, verified secure compilation in a sense? Um, and what security properties do we even want? And then I'll talk about, you know, how do we do verified compilation in the context of domain-specific languages or embedded domain-specific languages uh, and so on. And I'll talk about uh, compiling type-safe languages with FFIs as opposed to uh, C, which is not type-safe. Um, okay, so let me jump into how do we compiler correctness when we're compiling components. Um, okay, so let's start by talking about the standard notion of compiler correctness, which is for whole programs. All right, so if I have a P source, uh, source program PS, and I compile it to a target program PT, then um, basically the idea is that compiler correctness means that um, the target program PT should refine the behavior of the source program PS. And what that means is that every possible behavior of the target program PT should be a possible behavior of the source program PS, right? And basically this says, uh, you know, intuitively this is that compilation should preserve the meaning or the semantics of programs, right? This is a very simple idea to explain to anyone, to a student. You say, oh, I just want the meanings of programs, the observable behaviors of programs preserved when I compile. All right. Um, and it dates back to this really beautiful paper which we found, which um, it was uh, published at uh, the very first Poplin back in 1973. This is by uh, J. Lockwood Morris, who, uh, sorry, F. Lockwood Morris, who was following up on the McCarthy Painter paper, and uh, had this nice paper giving advice on structuring compilers and proving them correct. But essentially, it had this picture in it, which is very much the idea of refinement that I just showed you on the last slide. So since 73, I'd say we'd basically been proving the same in essentially the same sort of whole program compiler correctness theorems. Okay, um, so how do we even make sense of what we want uh, when we say that we want to correctly compile a component? So now I have a source component ES, I'm compiling it to a target component ET. Well, let's think about what we're gonna do with that um, compiled code. Well, we're gonna link it at some point with some other target code ET prime, right? And so what do we want at the end of the day from this picture? We want to be able to say something about the combined code, ET linked with ET prime, how that whole program, when I run it, how does it behave relative to what I'm seeing in the source, right? So really what I want is I want to be able to have some sort of guarantee from my compiler correctness theorem that ET linked with ET prime, that whole program, when I run it, um, will behave in a way that mirrors what happens when I run ES linked with what? What exactly? Right? And that is the big question here. Um, what do I want that target whole program behavior to match in the source? Okay, so um, I'm gonna write this as, uh, I'm gonna use that bow tie symbol for linking. Um, so basically we want to say that ET linked with ET prime refines the behavior of something on the source side which is ES linked with we don't know what, right? And the whole question is, how do we define what this question mark component is? What is its relationship to the ET prime? Clearly, there must be one. Um, and how do we then link it with the source? Okay. Um, so for instance, if question mark, that box is ET prime itself, then we do have a bit of an issue, right? We have to figure out how to link a source component with a target component. And that's not a thing that exists. Okay. All right. Um, the second main question that comes up uh, is, um, what target code do we allow uh, our code to be linked with. So our code meaning is, our code is the code ET that is produced by my verified compiler. What am I going to allow linking with? Okay, and there are restrictions you can impose on this. Um, so um, let me now tell you about some of the results that have come about in this area. So um, there's a sort of, uh, there have been a number of results. So uh, I've, I've organized this according to a sort of linking spectrum, if you will. So on the very left, I have uh, the original CompCert paper uh, from 06, which allowed linking with nothing. Um, and then um, the next paper here is SEP CompCert. This uh, showed how to take CompCert and extend it so that you can do separate compilation. What that means is that compiled code can be linked with code that is produced by the same SEP CompCert compiler. I will use the term separate compilation for that, okay? Um, then there is the result on Pilsner, which in essence allows you to link with the output of a different compiler, but only if, for compilers that are essentially compiling from the same source language as your compiler. Okay? Um, then there 
was this work on compositional compsert, which is uh, which was how to take the compsert compiler and make it truly compositional, as in link with anything. Effectively, it lets you link with any code in any of the languages in the compsert pipeline. Okay, so it's more powerful than just separate compilation, which sep compsert does. Um, and then uh, at the very end, there is this multi-language uh, approach that uh, my student Jamie Perconti and I worked on, which uh, essentially takes uh, allows you to link with arbitrary target code, in a sense, as long as it's well typed and follows certain calling conventions. Um, but this was a way of allowing you to link with code um, that might have behaviors that don't even exist in your own source language. Because often that's why you might want to write multi-language software, right? OK, so all of these results, I'm putting them up there because what's surprising is that they each formalize compiler correctness in a very different way, right? So it shows you that when, we have, uh, when we're trying to do correct compilation of components, there's a, a variety of possibilities here. So how do we make sense of these possibilities? And I'd like to spend the next um, several minutes talking about these results and how to make sense of them. So. Um, this year at ICFP, um, my student Daniel Patterson and I had a paper called The Next 700 Compiler Correctness Theorems. And this was the result of our effort over the last several years, uh, trying to understand the pros and cons of all of the compiler correctness theorems that I just showed you on, uh, compiler correctness results that I just showed you on the previous slide. Okay? How are they all different? What are their benefits? What are their drawbacks? Um, and I'd like you to, uh, to, to sort of lead you through it. So the way that we did this is we um, essentially gave a unifying statement of compositional compiler correctness. We called it CCC, or compositional compiler correctness. Um, and we built this statement as a sort of framework. And what we have in mind is that every single compositional compiler correctness result out there should be able to plug in the parameters of the framework. And once you've plugged it in and shown that, you know, from your compiler correctness statement follows our CCC theorem, then if we stare at those parameters, we will learn something useful about what your pros and cons are. All right, so let's sort of get through, go through that exercise. Okay, so here's, I'm gonna show you what our CCC statement is. So basically, uh, CCC, Compositional Compiler Correctness, says that if you compile a source component ES to a target component ET, um, then you might, um, we said, you know, we're gonna allow linking with some ET prime. So every single compiler correctness, Compositional Compiler Correctness result will have to specify what is the linking set. What is it? Your theorem will have to specify what is it that you allow linking with, all right? So um, basically, our, uh, you will have to somewhere specify a linking set L, which contains all of the target code ET prime that you might be able to link with, that you're allowed to link with. Uh, and also with that, I've put a proof term phi. And I'll show you later how you might need to use this proof term phi, okay? For some of the results that I'll um, instantiate uh, with CC. Okay, um, next, the mystery gray box. What do we want to say that ET linked with ET prime um, behaves like at the source side? Well, uh, here you have a number of choices. As I've already alluded to before, you could make that gray box just you know, come from, uh, it could be source code or it could be target code. Um, that is a possibility. Um, so you must specify what is your source target linking medium, all right? And different results make different choices on this. Uh, next, you have to somehow specify a, a lift function. This is not a function, sorry, it's actually a relation from your target code to your source target linking medium s hat. Okay? Some way of mapping the relationship essentially between the ET prime that you're allowed to link with and that gray box that somehow represents it at the top. Uh, then you have to specify what does it mean to link uh, source code with code in your source target linking medium. Okay? Uh, and of course, whenever we do these things, we have to specify target level linking uh, in any case, right? You sort of take that for granted. Okay, so um, these are all of the parameters for our CCC framework. And then here I'm gonna read out what the theorem should say. Um, basically, CCC says that there sh must exist, um, if there exists a lift function such that when ES compiles to ET, uh, then uh, ET linked with ET prime should refine the behavior of ES linked with the lift of ET prime, okay? Together with the proof, all right? So you see, it's conceptually what I was alluding to before, intuitively at least. 
Okay, so that's our CCC theorem, and then we have some extra sanity conditions, just one extra sanity condition on this lift relation because, you know, it's existentially quantified, but obviously you can't just plug in any lift relation. And so we have, um, I'll, I'm, I've just written it in English, we, just ha we have this requirement that says that this lift relation is inverse to compile on the compiler's own output. Okay? And that's the essence of it. We tried to keep these conditions on lift minimal. All right, so that's um, CCC, and of course, if, if we claim that this is compositional compiler correctness, like a standard definition that the entire community should be able to use, then it should have certain sanity conditions, such as um, it should obviously imply whole program uh, compiler correctness, and should, it should also imply separate compilation correctness, okay? So that's CCC. Um, now let's go back and take a look at uh, the different results that I told you about quickly before. Um, and how, for each one of these, how would you instantiate the parameters of the CCC theorem? And as I do this, I'll show you what it reveals to us about their pros and cons. Okay? All right. So um, let's take a look at the very first one, sep compsert, um, which is the separate compilation result. All right. So let's take a look at how you would instantiate the linking set L for sep compsert. Well, um, you would say that I can link with any EP as long as you give me, as part of my proof witness, you give me the ES that you compiled to ET using SEP Compser. So I can link with any ET such that I have an ES, and ES compiled to, has been compiled to ET with SEP Compser. So see, it is a separate compilation result, and the specification of the linking um, set is telling us that, right? You can't link with anything else that uh, was produced by something other than SEP Compser. Um, the S hat in this case, the source target linking medium is just the source language S itself. Uh, therefore, uh, the linking between S and S hat is just source linking. Um, and the lift relation simply takes that proof, you know, witness that I put in, the ES, and, you know, says, yeah, uh, do you want the, uh, the gray box that corresponds to the ET that I'm linking with? Well, it's just ES because ES is what I compiled to it. All right? Okay. Um, next. Uh, Let's take a look at Pilsner. Um, so Pilsner uh, uses a, a, what I would call a cross-language relation, a relation between source programs and target programs to specify what compiler correctness should mean. When are source programs related to target programs? Um, and here's how um, you would instantiate the linking set for Pilsner. Um, basically, this says that I can link with any ET. So let's say you. Let me, let me not say I, let me say you. You can link with any target component ET as long as you give me a proof that, uh, as long as you give me an ES, a source component, ES, and you give me a proof that that source component is cross-language related, according to my PILS relation, um, to this ET that I am linking with. In other words, you can't just give me some target code to link with, you have to also give me a proof that it is related to some particular source code. All right? So, so this, this is something um, that I think is quite striking, right? Because it says that um, if you want to uh, use a Pilsner, a uh, use Pilsner in order to link with something, you have a proof obligation that you must first fulfill, right? You can't just link with any arbitrary target code or assembly code. You have to give me the source code that is equivalent to it or related to it according to the PILS relation that the compiler is using, right? And if you then start to think about how would I produce such a proof, well, frankly, you would only be able to produce it if you were actually taking another PILS verified compiler and using it to compile that ES to that ET. Does that kind of make sense? And please ask questions if uh, I'm happy to. OK. All right. Um, so that's a pretty big ask in some sense, right? Um, OK. So um, S hat. Um, in this case, Pilsner uh, is very nice. It, and the S hat, the source tar target linking medium, is simply the source language S. And so the linking uh, S and S hat is just level linking. When we lift, the lift relation simply goes and plucks that source component that I asked you to give me when you said go link with ET, you had to give me the source component that matches it, right? Uh, so the lift relation will just produce uh, that ES for that gray question mark box that we have up there. Okay, now, the next two results. Um, compositional concert, next. Um, the linking set for compositional concert is really liberal in terms of what it allows you to link with. 
This is very nice. It basically allows you to link with any target code. Um, I left out one thing, any target code that satisfies effectively the concert memory model. All right? That's about it. Um, uh, the way that it then, so now it's allowing my gray box to just be target code, right? So that means you now have to somehow specify how that source component ES gets linked with this gray box, which is ET, a piece of target code, right? You need to define some sort of interaction semantics, that's what they do, um, to specify what it means for source and target code to interoperate, okay? And they do this in a language independent way, which is why I said earlier they are able to handle linking with effectively any uh, language that you might have in the entire CompCert pipeline. Okay, then um, adding, uh, sorry, linking S and S hat. The source target linking medium is just the target, right? It's T um, in a sense, or rather T in this interaction semantics. Uh, and so you, this effectively amounts to adding a module to the interaction semantics. And then uh, the lift relation simply produces just ET. You don't have to do anything else. You don't need to. So now if you want to link with some code, you don't have to produce any additional proof witness before you can go ahead and link with something. Okay, finally, the last result. Um, this is uh, using a multi-language approach. Uh, so basically, let me just say a few words about this. Um, the approach that we took here was we said, uh, okay, um, you specify a multi-language that takes the source language and the target language of the compiler and adds boundaries to them that permit interoperability between source and target code. And you define an operational semantics for those boundaries. Um, okay, so the linking set in this case, um, we allow linking with any target component as long as it's of translation type. This was a type-preserving compiler. Uh, then um, the source target linking medium is the multi-language, right? So it's the source plus the target plus these boundaries that allow mediation between source and target components or interoperability between source and target components. Uh, linking uh, is uh, simply, you know, the, uh, it's, uh, the, the, in, you link with any target code by you putting it in the multi-language. Uh, and the lift relation simply takes the target code that you wish to link with and wraps it in a source target boundary, which means that now you can take that target code and stick it into the middle of some source code and get interoperability. Okay? All right. Um, okay, so there's the CCC theorem. Um, so I've sort of, uh, you know, tried to focus on some of the pros and cons, especially in terms of the linking set and what you have to do in order to show me that it's okay to link with some target code if you were giving me some target code to link with. Uh, okay, so actually, let me just say a few words. Uh, so the hope here is that, you know, this kind of a uh, theorem gives us a social process that, you know, if all, if future compositional compiler correctness results would instantiate this kind of uh, a framework theorem, if you will, would instantiate CCC, then I think, you know, if you're a reviewer for the next paper on compositional compiler correctness, you might have a really hard time understanding their compositional compiler correctness theorem. But if they have actually shown you how they would instantiate the parameters for CCC, then you might have just a little bit of an easier time of it, especially in terms of comparing pros and cons to existing uh, approaches, okay? All right, that's the hope. Um, all right, so now let me get into uh, research challenges. Any questions, actually, at this point before I go on? Okay, all right, so what I want to talk about now is um, several big challenges that we don't have answers to. So far in my talk, I've focused on the last few years of, of people starting to do research on compositional compiler correctness, right? Uh, there have been a few results. They have specified compiler correctness in different ways, but now we have this you know, sort of framework to tie it together, and we're starting to understand what we mean by compositional compiler correctness, what we want it to mean. Um, but now I'm going to show you a bunch of questions which don't have any answers, all right? So, I don't know. And they're, they're big questions in a sense. Okay, so here's one observation. This one comes directly out of the work on uh, the CCC theorem. It, at least for me it does. Um, I'll try to explain that. All right, so um, research challenge one. Um, how to deal with multi-pass compiler verification? So every compiler is written in multiple passes. Every practical compiler is written in multiple passes. Right? And there is a tension between um, 
how much you need to know about the rest of the passes in your compiler when you're verifying just one. All right, so let me sort of get into that. Suppose that you're, um, just to take a simple example, suppose that you're compiling uh, this or, uh, an ML-like language, but let's say that it does not have any first-class control in it. Okay, and I have a two-pass compiler here in my picture. I'm compiling the source language S into intermediate language I, and then intermediate language I into target language T. All right, and here's what I wish for. I wish that when I was verifying that first pass from source to intermediate, S to I, I didn't have to know anything about what target language I'm ultimately going to compile to. Or maybe, you know, my target language is many, many levels deep down, but I don't want to know about it yet. I don't have to think about it yet. So it would be nice if I could go ahead and do optimizations or transformations um, for the S to I pass without having to think about later passes of the compiler. Now, I've, very, um, I've, I've written over there that my source language S doesn't have any um, first, uh, first class control and my language I doesn't have any first class control. But deep down, much later, I might link with code, in this case in my language T, which does have first class control features. All right. So if I go ahead and do optimizations in my S to I pass that sort of assume, what are optimizations, first of all? Optimizations are valid, are correct, if I take some code and I rewrite it to some equivalent code, right? Equivalent in what context? Well, equivalent when linked with any I code in this case. Intermediate language code. Intermediate language still doesn't have any first class control features in it. So if I go ahead and justify the correctness of S to I transformations by saying, uh, yeah, these are, you know, I'm rewriting code to be to something else, but it's equivalent. But I haven't taken into account that later on this equivalence is going to be affected by the first class control features that will only come into the picture much, much later in the uh, compiler pipeline, then I've clearly mistakenly proved some optimizations correct and they won't be correct by the time I get to the bottom. Right? How do we solve this problem? <laughs> this is a really hard problem. Um, and uh, just going back to the results that I showed you earlier, both uh, the compositional concert work and our own multi-language work, when we verify the correctness of every single pass of the compiler, in our multi-language work, we end up using a multi-language that knows about all of the intermediate languages in the entire compiler pipeline. In the compositional concert work, they end up using an equivalence relation that they define. They call it a structured simulation, but it knows about all of the passes of the concert piler, uh, compiler and, and accommodates them. Okay? Which means that this proof is kind of brittle. It's not really compositional, right? Um, and it would be cool if we could do something about that. So new ideas are needed here. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, I've actually already said this. Optimizations that only take SI into account will fail later on. Um, okay, so that was challenge one. Let's move on to challenge two. Um, there has been so much focus in the community on CompCert and compiling C-like languages that um, you know, I, there's, there's some thought that I think needs, that needs to go into what happens when you compile type-safe languages. And in particular, if you're taking this whole idea of, you know, I'm not simply making a whole pro program assumption, I'm compiling components. That means that I'm compiling a type-safe language and I, I might, after compilation, link it with some code that came from a language that is less richly typed. Okay? That is a very important scenario. It doesn't arise if I'm only compiling C because C is so liberal, it allows you to link with everything, right? Okay, so this is a whole new thing to think about. So for the example here, I picked Rust. Suppose that you are, the co verified compiler that you are writing is not a verified compiler for ML. You are writing a verify, implementing a verified compiler for Rust. Rust's type system is richer than ML's type system in the sense that it understands ownership and borrowing, right? It uh, allows you to manage memory. So um, what happens in this picture? So I'm, I'm implementing a verified compiler for Rust, ES compiles to ET, and at the bottom then I'm linking with some code that came from ML. Uh, now, if I take Rust objects and pass them over to ML, ML might keep copies of them and then pretend to pass them back. 
in which case Rust's ownership discipline has just been violated, right? This is linking, this is important. Linking is part of compositional compiler correctness. So how do we account for behaviors like that, right? We can't possibly claim to, to properly verify a Rust compiler without handling that scenario somehow, right? Um, so what do we do about that? So this is the point where I wanna say that, you know, you cannot do um, compiler verification for scenarios like this without first taking head on the challenge of uh, what is the FFI between ML and Rust? Or rather the question of what is a safe principled FFI between ML and Rust? Because if you don't have one, then you're going to allow bad linking with ML, and that means that you're not your compiler is semantics preserving, but it's not preserving the semantics of ownership, right? That's, there's a tension there. Um, okay, so, um, so basically I think verifying the Rust compiler requires that we figure um, what, you know, better FFIs between languages of this sort, right? Um, and uh, I've already kind of said this, such questions don't arise when you're verifying C compilers because C allows you to link with pretty much everything, right? So, so you, when, when you are verifying a compiler, you are sitting there thinking, I am this language. If you're verifying a compiler for the liberal language, <laughs> then everything seems okay. If you're verifying a compiler for the tighter language, things get bad <laughs> after comp compilation, right? Because you allow linking with that anything and then your uh, source level guarantees are gone, even type safety. Okay, so um, we've, uh, my group has noticed that there are parallels between the work that's happening in gradual typing and the kinds of questions that we wanna ask about what is a good theory for designing principled FFIs between two arbitrary languages, one which is more richly typed and the other one um, with less precise types. Um, and uh, so, so this is based on uh, my student Max New has been doing work on a theory of gradual typing um, and uh, my student Daniel Patterson is trying to sort of draw on those ideas and try to figure out if I have uh, the language Rust here and I have the language ML, if I want to come up with this idea of when it's, uh, you know, which types in Rust are more precise than which types in ML or vice versa, depending on which direction my FFI is going in, um, when can I say that that actually is the case? Right? When should we consider types in one language, which looks very different from the other language, when can I consider types in one language to be more precise than types in the other? Can we draw on ideas from say, gradual typing and safe gradual typing to, to kind of put some you know, sort of um, good semantic reasoning in place here? Um, so um, basically the idea is that if we could come up with this idea of which types are more precise than the types in the other language, then we could compile in a way so that we make sure that we insert the right checks at the boundary just like you might in gradual typing, right? Just like you do in gradual typing. Um, and that, that way you can ensure safety. Um, now this is different from gradual typing because in gradual typing the terms of the language are identical. It's just that one language has richer types or more precise types than the other one. Here, even the terms are different. So there's a representation change involved. So this is a much, uh, it's a harder and more general problem. Um, and the other funny thing is, we're not entirely sure. It seems to us that if you're doing a FFI from Rust to ML, that might not be uh, symmetric with the, Rust, with the FFI uh, going the other way from ML to Rust, okay? So there are choices I think that you can make uh, that might be different for the two different directions. Okay, all right, when do I end? Started at 2.20? I have time. Yeah, okay, good. All right, so research challenge number three. So this relates to this idea of secure compilation, right? So now that we're not assuming we're compiling whole programs, we're actually compiling components, these components are being linked with target code. Maybe not entirely arbitrary target code, but target code nonetheless. Target code usually tends to be much more, uh, you know, target languages are much more expressive, much more featureful. They do nasty things like jump all over the place, <laughs> right? Um, so uh, how do we protect our compiled code from code that we're linking with, right? So, so generally I'm sort of referring to this idea of protection of your compiled code, or loosely speaking, uh, an idea of secure compilation. But secure compilation can be a lot of different things. <laughs> Um, and it's not really clear what, what you want, right? You first have to make a decision as to what security properties are you preserving? What are you interested in having? Um, where are these, and if you use the word preserving, 
security properties that you're preserving, then did they exist in the source language in the first place? Right? <laughs> OK. So um, often people talk about, is CompCert secure? Right? So let's just talk about that first. Is CompCert secure? Um, CompCert is a C compiler. It does a whole lot of optimizations. Um, some of these optimizations, and this is well known, um, some of these optimizations might um, you know, violate something that the programmer was trying to do. So let's take a look at an example. So this example is drawn out of some uh, crypto implementation. It's just a tiny little snippet, but basically what we have here is I have a function crypt, and I'm assuming that this function, uh, you know, that this code has um, received a, uh, some key over a secure channel. And now this key is, you know, within crypt. Um, so crypt reads the key, then it works with the secure key, and at the end, it scrubs the memory. Right? So we put, we write zero into key so that nobody else can read it after we're done with crypt. Okay? Now, if you compile this code with CompCert or any other C compiler, um, it will do a bunch of optimizations. In particular, it will do uh, dead store elimination. Right? Key is being, we're putting a zero in key, but key never gets read again because that's the end of the scope. Right? And so if you do dead store elimination, you're removing that very last assignment, which means the programmer so carefully thought about the fact that I have to scrub the memory, and now the optimizer has undone it, <laughs> right? Okay, so, but how is this poor compiler supposed to know that it shouldn't do this optimization? Did the programmer tell it? <laughs> and that's the point, this key equals zero to stay in there, <laughs> right? This is quite intentional, as opposed to other things which might not which, you know, compilers should optimize away. Um, and then there are lots of other compiler optimizations that can cause various side channel leaks. Um, you know, so again, similar problem. The programmer wrote some code thinking, all right, I'm doing some secure programming, I'm checking for something, and the compiler gets rid of those things or um, tries to make things faster and as a result in introduces timing leaks, side channel leaks. Okay, so my take here is that the compiler shouldn't have to guess the programmer intent. Um, if you want secure compilation, the programmer should be able to specify to the compiler that I really mean for this part to be secure, don't optimize here or something like that, right? So what I'm trying to say is that you can't just take regular C, the C that CompCert compiles right now, for instance, and suddenly say, can I make CompCert secure? Because you don't know what, what you're trying to preserve. It didn't exist, you would just be guessing, right? You could try to sort of, um, you know, harden your code you doing certain, uh, by adding certain protections, but it wouldn't be foolproof in a sense, right? Okay, so, um, yeah, sorry, the, the last line that I had over here is, um, you know, how can a programmer specify to the compiler that, um, you know, they actually want certain guarantees or, or they don't want certain optimizations to be done? Well, we could, we could um, start using DSLs to specify, you know, let's say you want to do constant time programming, you could use a DSL for that. Um, if you, um, or you could develop language extensions if you really want to, uh, the programmer to somehow specify, you know, be, if the programmer wants to write secure code and wants to tell the compiler that this is what they mean, right? You need some language mechanism or at least compiler flags to indicate intent about security. Okay, so then that leads me to sort of three broad challenges on this slide, and I'll just talk about these at a very, very high level. So the first one, um, DSLs. So um, I put as, as an example this DSL called FACT, which is a, a small DSL for constant time programming. Um, so constant time programming is when you, uh, you know, <laughs> you write, if, if you're doing constant time programming in C, you're basically trying to avoid all sorts of, you know, um, if and else's, weird control flow, loops, etc. You're trying to write very, very straight line code. You basically don't want the compiler to mess with what you're doing, right? Um, because you want a guarantee of constant time even after compilation. So this is very, very painful to write. And um, there's, uh, there was this PLDI 19 paper this year from uh, um, Dian Stefan and Ranjit Chala and various others uh, uh, that developed a DSL for doing this. So uh, FACT basically compiles into a bunch of different backends. What it does that's really nice is that it lets you write natural code, you the programmer, write natural code, and it produces the crazy munged up, you know, constant time kind of patterns that, that you want. Okay. But now if we're going to develop DSLs like this for doing, you know, let's broadly call them secure DSLs, DSLs for doing some variant of secure programming, um, then uh, here's the research challenge. 
um, as we develop these DSLs, how do we verify uh, that they are in fact, uh, you know, preserving, when we compile them, that the compiler is in fact preserving the guarantee that the DSL claims to give the programmer. Right? That's the promise of the DSL. This is a DSL for constant time programming. <laughs> so, so now how do we verify the compiler for that DSL? Right? Um, and this gets into all sorts of interesting questions of, uh, well, this is the security property that I want preserved. How do I formally state it, et cetera? And the problem again, the culprit again, is after that DSL code is compiled, it will link with target code that is far more expressive. And it can mess up the guarantees that you thought that you had in the source level, which in this case is a much smaller DSL not the full host language or target language that you're compiling to. Okay, so it's again the you know, linking with things that's the problem. Um, another area, much bigger in some sense, um, how many people have heard the term language-oriented programming? Okay, um, so this is the idea, there was a CACOM article about it um, last year. Um, so um, language-oriented programming is the idea that, um, you know, Develop a little language, a little DSL, if you will, an embedded DSL, um, in order to do a certain task rather than rely on a, on a library or just sort of write the code uh, from scratch. Uh, this has benefits for uh, novice programmers, for instance. You need one expert programmer to create a hash lang for a particular task, and then many uh, you know, uh, non-expert programmers get to benefit from that. Um, okay, so language-oriented programming, you can do this in uh, a language like Racket. You can create these hash langs, which are these little uh, embedded DSLs. Um, so the question here is, you have a programmer, the expert programmer, come in and create a little hash lang, all right? The hash lang then gets expanded into the host language. The host language is far more expressive than the little hash lang, which was trying to give users a more limited view of the world, right? So they could do certain tasks more easily. Um, is this expansion or compilation correct? Ultimately, that, that embedded DSL, the hash lang, is going to expand into the host language, which, as I just said, is far more expressive. And so what are those interactions? Um, are the guarantees that the hash lang purports to give the programmers actually preserved by, the, by compilation? Right? So this is, this is hard because the person writing the hash lang is, I mean, this is essentially the idea of macros, right? You're, you're just going to expand into the host language. They don't even think they're writing a compiler. How are they going to verify it? Uh, but what if they're writing a secure uh, hash lang for doing some, something security related? Maybe we do want to verify it. How? Right. Okay. So just a thought. Uh, and this is something that I've been talking to Matthias Felison about. Um, those of you who are interested. Um, okay, so number three, uh, this is more along the idea um, of, you know, you have an existing language and maybe you want to add certain, um, you want to extend it in a certain way in order to do um, particular tasks and in particular what I had in mind was uh, security and crypto. Um, so suppose that you uh, want to um, write secure multi-party computation. Uh, there are languages out there that, um, you know, with with primitives and things that would allow you to do that. Um, there is um, something called obliv-c, which adds these obliviousness constructs to C. Um, there is a language uh, Mike Hicks and co-authors developed, which is called Wisteria for doing MPC. Um, so now in this case, what's happening is that you are writing a secure distributed application. Your compiler for the language is compiling code that you write down into, um, you know, certain parts of your program might get turned into uh, crypto things like garbled circuits, okay? Because that's how you're, you're cryptographically getting a guarantee of security. Or your code might get linked in with certain crypto primitives or protocols. So now what is the end-to-end -end compiler correctness or secure compilation guarantee here? Right now things get much more complicated. Even stating what secure compilation is, because now it's cryptographically enforced secure compilation becomes much harder. Right. Okay. Um, you need crypto and PL people working together on that, probably. <laughs> okay. Um, and that is something, actually, that I am working on with my crypto colleague, Abhi Shalat. Um, okay. So, um, research challenge number four. So, I've been talking a lot about, you know, when I showed you that earlier picture of uh, Rust compiling down to a target and then linking with code that might have come from ML. Um, the question that I want to pose now is, when does the linking happen? When do we need to check? All right, so um, the, the logical thing here is that um, if, you, 
if you have all of the source components that you're going to put together, then perhaps you could, if you had nice principled FFIs, you could do che checking at the source level and figure out that, yeah, I'm not going to be linking with something that would violate my safety guarantees or my safety assumptions. But if I'm simply compiling code down to a target level and then later being given some code that I'm going to link with, then I kind of need to take the, sec the security requirements or safety requirements in my language, let's say it's Rust, and I need to translate them down to some target level in terms of ownership and borrowing. Maybe we need to find a way to translate those requirements down to a target level and at the target level, um, you know, preserve types down to some target level and then check against the other code and make sure that that code satisfies those types, right? So what I'm saying is um, if we're going to do this kind of thing um, and delay checking of safety guarantees until link time, then we need a way to encode those guarantees in the target level, right? So maybe we need typed uh, low-level languages or typed intermediate languages in order to capture those guarantees. So I'll put this picture up now. Um, what we're trying to work on is, you know, um, this idea of uh, WebAssembly. Uh, WebAssembly is a sort of minimally typed but type safe language. Um, but can we take WebAssembly and extend it into a richer platform for doing this kind of uh, multi-language linking? Uh, so that, you know, um, the question that we're looking at right now, uh, you know, is what does WebAssembly need to be extended with so that we could do type preserving compilation from Rust? That's the specific one that we're looking at. I have other languages in this picture, of course. You see ML compiling to WebAssembly, and for those of you who know WebAssembly, know that it currently does not support garbage collection, so that's a problem. I have a bullet on that. Um, you know, so, so there are other things, but you know, there are a lot of people who um, believe in WebAssembly sort of becoming a, a, a much richer platform for a lot of interoperability between different languages and also compiling to multiple um, you know, hardware backends. Uh, so you know, this hopefully fits in that. Um, of course, when you are compiling normal C code to WebAssembly, then you're compiling to sort of the standard, less richly typed WebAssembly. So there is going to be a sort of gradual typing flavor to what happens in this language, right? There will be dynamic checks at the boundary between less precisely typed and more precisely typed code. And that's scary. Because for those of you who know about gradual typing, there was, there's a very famous and well-quoted paper which uh, was titled, Is Sound Gradual Typing Dead? So if you put a lot of checks at that boundary, the performance gets really, really bad, okay? And there are a lot of very smart people working right now on how do we get around these performance issues, right? People are investigating ideas that have to do with, uh, you know, VMs and JITs, and I put up hardware solutions in there that for, uh, as a possible path to investigate. Can we push some of these dynamic checks down into the hardware so that they can be done uh, in a more performant way? Okay. Um, so, takeaways. My last slide. Um, basically, um, this whole area, once you start to say that I'm, uh, once you start to be honest about the fact that when your compiled code is going to be linked with some other code, that's simply how we use our compilers, then compiler verification just, you know, opens up a lot of really neat and interesting challenges. Um, and, you know, just to sort of go through them really quickly, I, I, I talked about uh, the first challenge, which was about how do we build truly um, vertically compositional multi-pass compilers without having to think about all of the passes at once? Um, how do we, um, you know, wrap our heads around this idea of what are safe or principled FFIs between languages? Because if we don't have them, then I don't know quite how we should be thinking about uh, interop with less precisely typed languages while preserving the semantic guarantees that we have in a language like Rust or richer typed languages. Um, number three, how do we do um, compiler verification or secure compilation for DSLs or extensions to languages? Uh, because again, the more expressive code at the target level that you link with might mess up those security assumptions or guarantees. Um, number four, you know, this idea of designing a single platform which is rich enough to allow you to check all sorts of linking um, and make sure that you have, uh, have safety. And then number five, you know, how 
if, if that gradual typing stuff happens, those checks are going to be expensive. So all of this work will be for naught if we can't get rid of the performance issues, right? And so maybe um, we should be investigating how can we uh, use hardware to get rid of those checks. And so what I've shown you here really is this massive sort of, you know, research agenda in some sense, multiple research agendas from multiple groups. And I think we, uh, if we want to tackle problems like this, we ultimately need people who are experts at lots of different, you know, different groups who are experts at different things, from semantics and theory to uh, compilation to hardware and, and even computer architectures, right? Um, basically people working on the entire software stack and maybe even the software hardware part of the stack. Right, coming together and, and tr starting to put things together. Okay, um, so that's it. Um, that's a link to our group website. Um, and happy to take questions. Okay, we have uh, plenty of time for a couple of questions. Hi. Um, I might have missed it, uh, but do these compositional theorems hold for multi-threaded programs too? Uh, there are um, there are now a couple of results. I believe there was a paper at PLDI um, 19, yes, um, by Xinyu Feng and his students, uh, which basically takes uh, CompCert and uh, you know adds support for concurrency and threading. And I think there was another effort, but I, I can't remember right now <laughs> off the top of my head. Recent one is, is much more impressive. Yes? Since hardware came up as an important factor, especially in near the end of your talk, I wonder if we should be buying up old um, list machine company patents because the idea of hardware that default boxes and tags everything mm -hmm. and does a lot of the things that you need done um, fast uh, right. it seems to be uh, maybe we'll return to that I want to know what you think um, oh, I don't really know but um, well I'm, I'm sort of interested in a whole bunch of hardware efforts um, it's hard to know what will work out, and this is not my area of expertise, I have to sort of say that up front. Um, but you know, there, uh, there was uh, the, uh, the, uh, a tagged machine for, um, called the pump architecture that was developed at Penn a few years ago, which is the same sort of idea, right? There are tags everywhere and you can, you can insert dynamic checks. Um, there is uh, the uh, software, Intel software guard extensions, which lets you do uh, certain things. It's not quite the tagging idea, though. Uh, and then, you know, uh, the Cherry architecture, which is capability machines, uh, that's another interesting architecture, uh, which seems quite promising. Um, but, yeah, this, this really needs people who can sit at that hardware-software boundary um, and, you know, and somehow, and be able to take the bulk of the dynamic checks and be able to translate them into hardware. Um, the, the hope that I have is that, well, or the observation that I have, I, I'll say, is that you need to somehow, pre, you know, communicate down to your target language what are the things that you need checked, right? So that's where I sort of think of this, uh, the, the platform that I was talking about, whether it's richly typed WebAssembly or some other low-level language. Uh, but you need to have some sort of checks at that level so that those checks can then get turned into uh, the appropriate checks in the hardware. Right? Because if you don't have that information, then you don't have a whole lot to work with. Yeah. So, wonderful talk. Oh, Thank you. Um, let's say you know, you're, you're in this sort of secure compilation world where maybe you can't trust the people that you're you know, linking with. Mm -hmm. What's the story for when, when the other side actually is sort of doing everything right? Like, let's say the other side is just as typed as you are. Uh -huh. Like, how? Like, you know, like gradual typing or, or something like that might say, oh, we're going to just do a bunch of runtime checks anyways. Yeah. But it'd be kind of nice to not have to, right? So uh, you is there a story for... trust. Yeah, so how can we establish trust? Is there a story for that? Or? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I come from the trust but verify world. <laughs> anyway, <No>. sorry. <laughs> that was a motto when I was a PhD student in our group. <laughs> um, but... Um, or is that the, I mean, or w verify when, maybe, or, or what's the, or how, or, you know. If you have, well, maybe this goes back to if you have the other code that you're going to link with at an earlier stage, right, you could do some type checking 
um, right? We could make sure that the types in my, of my module and your module, even if they're coming from different languages, match up in a certain way, right? That's a matter of designing higher level FFIs and type checking at a source level. And therefore statically getting, you know, making sure that things are okay so that you never have to do the dynamic checks. And actually in all of this game, even when I was talking about, you know, a theory for principled FFIs, um, there is a spectrum there. There are certain things that you will be able to check statically and then only when you can't check statically do you need the dynamic checks. And I think we really need to figure that out because you know, static checks means performance gains. Right? You have to check less at runtime. So I don't know, I didn't quite answer your question, but I don't know how to answer the question about trust. <laughs> if there are no more questions, let's take them all again. All right.